this morning's epistle reading from Romans chapter 8, verse 14, we hear this word of the Lord. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So far, God's word for today. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father and His Son, our Savior, Jesus. Amen. How many of you remember playing the game Follow the Leader? Rules were really simple, wasn't it? Just do whatever the leader did. So if the leader were to stick out his tongue and wiggle his ears, well, you stuck out your tongue and you wiggled your ears. Or if the leader were to start hopping on one foot, you would start hopping on one foot. Or if the leader rubbed their stomach and patted their head, you would rub your tummy and pat your head too, right? The goal was to perfectly mimic what the leader was doing. And if you failed to follow the leader, you were out of the game. Well, in a way, sanctification or godly living is much like playing follow the leader. Now, while we are not saved by our good works, but by the grace of God, our good works, or lack thereof, says something about our faith relationship with the Savior Jesus. That is what Paul is trying to get at in today's epistle reading. So if you have your Bible with you, I encourage you, turn to Romans chapter 8. We pick up at verse 12. So then, brothers... We are, not, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. So far, God's word. Now, the first thing that strikes this old boy's mind is that repeated use of words that kind of describe family. Words like brothers, sons, adoption, children, heirs. Paul pictures the life of a believer in terms of a divine family relationship. Godly living is imagined as being a part of God's family of faith. To me, a way to conceive this is found in looking at the royal family of England, often referred to as the firm headed up by the queen. The firm is made up of all the royal family members, both the direct heirs to the crown, such as Prince Charles, Prince William, and Prince George, as well as the indirect heirs, such as Prince Edward, Prince Andrew, Princess Anne, Prince Harry, and others. Now, while most people are enamored with the status and the pomp of the royals, there are some very strict rules and high expectations placed on them. It's not easy living as a part of the firm, as their every word and gesture is analyzed and criticized by both fan and foe alike. And while the firm looks good in their finery, being on that balcony with the queen has some very stringent requirements to be met. And there are consequences when one doesn't meet them, as Harry and Meghan discovered as they watched the parades from the cheap seats. As is common with all families, life in a family involves many privileges and responsibilities. Sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. This is both an obligation on the part of the son, but it's also an evidence of his sonship. The professed Son of God who lives in careless indifference to the Spirit or even in open defiance to the Spirit is at best a living contradiction and at worst a spiritual imposter. Many who think themselves Christians fail to be led by the Spirit 
remaining a person more tied to the flesh, living according to a flesh which ultimately will lead to death. That is a total separation from God who is the author, the giver, and protector of life. As Paul points out this morning, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Preaching on this same biblical passage, Martin Luther once said, St. Paul was occupied, as we too are, with two classes of people, genuine and false Christians. For the danger arising from opponents of Christian doctrine, like our danger from popery, is not so great, for these folks express themselves so publicly that we are well able to guard against them. But since the devil sows his seed among those of us who are also called Christians and boast of the gospel, we must note not the mouth, but the works of such boasters, not what they say, but what they do. For it is easy to boast of God, Christ, and the Spirit. But this will prove whether such boasting is justified. If the Spirit is also active and operative in you, so as to suppress and mortify your sins. For wherever the Spirit is, there he surely is not idle and impotent, but proves his presence by controlling and inciting man. And man also heeds and follows him. And such a person has a consolation that he is a child of God, and that God rules and works in him. Therefore, he is not in death, he has life. End quote. In both the Old Testament and Gospel readings for today, the alarm is raised about false prophets, of those who would boast of their faith but are belied by their deeds. The Lord Jesus sounds this warning, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous rules. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. You know, if you'll recall, Jesus himself was led by the Spirit. Once again, if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. This follows Jesus being baptized by John in the Jordan River. Note what is said. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Just as Jesus was led by the Spirit, we are to realize that we are led by the Spirit, as was our Lord and our Savior and our brother. We are to come under the Spirit's control and to be alert to His promptings. The leading of the Spirit, which Christ experienced, came to Him because He was full, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. This idea of spirit control and domination is also brought out by Paul's use of the Greek word agontai, led, which is best understood as an overwhelming compulsion. It is the picture of the spirit dragging a man where the flesh would never choose to go. Now the leading of the Holy Spirit can be experienced in both positive and negative forms as Paul knew from his own experience. When he and Silas were traveling in the Roman provinces, they tried hard to enter into Asia. But the Holy Spirit thwarted their efforts, blocking their path. So they turned their attention to Bithynia, only to discover that the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Now despite obvious feelings of frustration, they continued to work and to explore the possibilities until the famous vision of the man from Macedonia came to Paul from the Spirit. And when they followed this vision, and when they heeded the Spirit's prompting, everything quickly fell into place. 
And they arrived in the place of God's choosing to fulfill the task of reaching the people for Christ. It is important that we take note that sons of God learn to order their lives in a commitment and a dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Being led by the Spirit, they can respond to His leading, to His guiding, to His prompting. Now this idea of sons of God, by the way, is a pejorative term. It speaks of both sons and daughters, a priest of all believers. So, once the sons, and I would also include here the daughters, are clear about the details and the intent of the Spirit's directing, it remains only for them to respond in glad obedience. It's just as Luther teaches us in his small catechism, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. The Holy Spirit has called me by the Gospel. Enlighten me with His gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. It is the Holy Spirit who speaks to us in God's Word and empowers us through the sacraments to walk by faith with God. It is the Spirit who points us to the cross to see our Savior dying for our sins in order that He could then be raised for our salvation. It is He who bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Led by the Spirit, we come to the cross, and there we receive the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The idea of one's sonship indicates an equality among all believers, male and female, young and old, as to their kingdom status. We're all adopted as God's sons, God's children, members of his royal family, princes and princesses of his kingdom of grace. And led by the Spirit, we do not fall back into fear, wondering if we'll ever be good enough for God. Rather, we're affirmed and we are encouraged for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, a reason many people don't feel the Spirit's presence is because they fail and to enter into that presence, that is, to be where the Spirit is to be found. If the Spirit is present in the Word of God, but a person is not faithful in reading the Bible, how will they ever hear His promptings? Shouldn't we eagerly be in the Word, in Bible study, in worship, in daily devotion? If baptism marks us as a people who have been redeemed by Christ as the Spirit unites us with Him in the washing of regeneration and renewal, then shouldn't we daily remember our baptism and be renewed in the Spirit's calling upon our life? As we receive the sacrament, do we not recall the Spirit's presence and reminder that as we come and we receive the bread and the wine, we receive Christ's very body and blood for the forgiveness of sins? In short, if we absent ourselves from God's means of grace, wherein the Spirit both lives and works, then how do we ever expect to live according to the Spirit? How can we expect not to live according to the flesh and subsequently die if we're not led by the Spirit? by gathering together where the Spirit dwells in word and sacrament. We can't. We don't. If godly living is like playing follow the leader and we don't, we're out of the game. Paul gives us a sure and certain promise, one that can, we can depend on. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And so with the psalmist this morning, let us confidently declare, But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground, and in the great assembly, I 
will bless the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please.